we are here uh, for this session on um, a word that was probably breached for the first time in one of the Raisina dialogues a couple of years ago, how the whole India digital stack is uh, now a digital public good. And, uh, and you know, the, the similarity is akin to digital public infrastructure is equivalent to physical infrastructure, whether it's roads, rails, um, waterways, whatever, uh, electricity grid. So this is, uh, this is where it all started. We are very uh, happy and delighted that we have a very diverse panel. Uh, without uh, much ado, uh, Mr. Kant, you've been the champion of uh, digital public infrastructure that India has been building, the whole India model. Can you, can you give us in your views, the whole transformation and the role digital public infrastructure has played in this transformation story of India, and and what are uh, you know how it is being received uh, globally given our G20 presidency. Arvind, uh, if you look at the last uh, two and a half decades, uh, all innovations, all technological breakthroughs have come from uh, the big tech model of USA. Uh, and uh, so Google, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, and uh, in the case of China, Tencent, Alibaba. Uh, they were able to do this because they took over citizens' data and then used AI and uh, moved forward with a number of innovative solutions. Uh, Europe represented by Andreas came up with an alternative model of GPRD and that uh, they focused on privacy at the cost of innovation. India has done something very unique, unparalleled. It created the public infrastructure which is owned by public or government uh, and on top of which we've allowed these are the railway tracks on which we've allowed trains to run, which are the private sector owned. And there has been a huge amount of innovation. So these are open source, open APIs, interoperable models on which private sector is competing with each other. So India is the only country where phone pay competes with Google pay. Uh, WhatsApp competes with Paytm and in fact 40 different payment apps are competing and uh, therefore uh, I have not used my uh, debit card, credit card for the last four years. I have not been to a physical bank and I have not been to an ATM machine. Uh, my mobile is my virtual bank and this was possible because we created digital identity for 1.4 billion people of India. Then between 2015 to 2017, India opened up 480 million bank accounts. Uh, we embedded every bank account with both your digital identity and your mobile number. And therefore, between 2015 to 2017, 55% of the bank accounts opened across the world. That is every second bank account opened in the world was opened in India. And today, India does 11x more payments, more fast payments than what USA and Europe do. It does 4x more digital payments than what China does. So fast payment is one story. During COVID, we were able to use COVID to give paperless uh, digital vaccination to 2.2 billion people, that is 6x the population of USA and Europe, 2.2 billion people. Uh, my daughter who lives in San Francisco, all her vaccination was on paper. And uh, then we've created a digi locker where all your records are stored, your driving license, your insurance, everything. And because of this, We've, we've done fast tags in education, we've done uh, uh, d Swayam and Diksha and many other DPIs. But then, because we had done digital payments, you had young startups, unicorns, who used this cashless, paperless payment model 
And looking at the credit history, they moved to do uh, digital lending, which was paperless and cashless. So you had Mobiquick, Lending Card, Pine Labs, all unicorns now. They all did paperless lending. And then you had a set of new startups like Zeroda, Upstock. Imagine, imagine Zeroda holds 25% of the stock market of India. I mean, they got into wealth creation, which was paperless, cashless. And they reached out to people in tier two, tier three city, rural areas. Uh, and then there was a new set of startups which started doing insurance. So you had Digit, Echo working on this and all doing one minute you get an insurance policy, uh, which used to take six months. And uh, you know, in India, when I was a young officer, I was working with traditional fishermen in Kerala, opening their bank account was a nightmare. Uh, know your customer was a nightmare. It used to take us seven, eight months. Today we do it in less than a minute. So the digital leapfrogging of India has been just enormous. And I think this is the model for the future. This model of open source, open API, and interoperable model pushes for innovation. It ensures privacy, and it ensures data empowerment of the citizens. We have the Data Empowerment Protection Act architecture, which ensures that the data is owned by the citizens, and that is what RBI is built on and use the account aggregator system to provide credit to the MSMEs. So it's a path-breaking model. Innovations come from the developed part of the world, but this is one innovation which has come. The DPIs are one innovation from emerging market which has overtaken the developed part of the world. So, Th thank you, Mr. Kant. And I, as I say, nobody can tell this better than you, but um, you know, and I will just put my little bit uh, two cents to it that the cost of customer acquisition in India, whether it is for the telcos or the banks or the insurance companies, is the lowest in the world today, down from twenty-five dollars to half a half a dollar, and that is enabled by the EKYC and the and the digital uh, locker products that we have. And 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 to summarize, uh, you know, the tech for uh, profit model that the Silicon Valley has had, and the tech for surveillance that uh, Shenzhen Valley has had. Um, um, the third model is tech for regulation, which I'll ask you, Andres. And India's model is new data for development or technology for development. So I think that is well summarized, um, Mr. Kant. Andreas, obvious question to you. Um, as I said, uh, Europe has practiced uh, technology for regulation. You find them a little bit here and there, and um, you're happy that you're doing some tech regulation. Um, and uh, I know, um, how, do we, how do we see um, how do you perceive this new model coming from India, um, especially with the constraints that you have with GDPR and others? And do you see uh, Europe, EU learning from this, adapting to this as we go along? Thanks so much, Arvind. First of all, I should probably say, how can you let me speak after this man here, uh, which is always so passionate, uh, so you can only lose uh, speaking after him. Uh, but let me first say, I mean, the D in OECD stands for development, and I'm working as director for global relations with more than 100 developing countries. I'm working very intensively with India's G20 presidency, with Amit Kant, uh, on advancing in a partnership uh, uh, process uh, joint solutions to this. So I'm not here to defend any European model or any US, uh, US model. I'm here to look for ways how we can make, uh, generate a framework, a global framework, a global architecture for data free flow with trust uh, for digital public infrastructure. And I actually think it's fantastic what India is doing here. And, uh, you know, it, lay, it takes visionaries, uh, entrepreneurs, pioneers uh, like Gates or Steve Jobs on the private sector to change our life. But it also takes uh, visionaries like Amitabh Kant, pioneers, uh, to change the, the, the mood in the public sector and to provide the digital public infrastructure. And I really want to highlight and welcome the, the personal leadership and the pioneership of, of Amitabh here. And it's something which we, well, we as OECD fully support and we work to, together in the G20 to further advance India's priorities on this uh, in the field of data for development, in the field of data uh, free flow with trust. Uh, I want to give you maybe uh, three hashtags in Twitter style staccato where I think we need to continue to work together. Hashtag number one is inclusiveness. We need to make sure that what we provide is open for everybody. 
Uh, in the pandemic, we saw that uh, many of our systems uh, in Europe or in uh, all over the world are kind of prioritizing the urban areas and not so much the rural areas. So there is an urban-rural divide. There is also a divide uh, between some rich and some poor. And for example, when we saw in this homeschooling, uh, there were regions which were not so well connected with the internet. So the kids in these regions uh, have uh, less potential to, to access uh, to schools. There is the question of who has an iPad, who is uh, working on his old smartphone. So there are a number of questions in terms of inclusiveness we under, answer, need to answer. Hashtag number two is uh, trust uh, and human-centric. And uh, this is something uh, I, I think uh, you have, you've done a lot of uh, work in kind of creating for the vaccination a trustful uh, system, which is a model for the rest of the world. And this brings me to the last hashtag. This is uh, digital identity. And here again, uh, India is leading by example with uh, the identity card, uh, with the credit card, uh, with the digital credit card. I, I saw last week in Bengaluru uh, the, the, coin, the digital currency the RBI has, uh, has presented. So again, uh, fantastic. But we need to make sure that the systems we are creating there are interoperable. That's a difficult word, and I'm always kind of fall over it, but uh, this time it was okay. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an important thing to do. So, and that's why we're sitting together in the G20. And that's why we, we, we as OECD, we also want to help and support that we come to a meaningful, uh, let's say, global infrastructure where everybody can maybe drive with his own car with his own, uh, some, by, some people may, may other vehicles, some, some people may, may come with their electronic vehicles, some other may use fossil fuel for a time. But uh, this, is, uh, this is what we're there for. Thank yeah. you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Um, Kezum, can I uh, go next for, with you? Can, um, you know, how do these digital public infrastructure um, that, again, India has championed so well, uh, converge with the developmental model of UNDP and how can we take it forward? Arvind, thank you so much for that question. It's a pleasure to be here from the United Nations Development Program with such an esteemed panel. Hello, Mr. Kant. Um, you know, we are in a time when digital is, um, is really systemic um, uh, and fundamental. Uh, it's no longer just an enabler. And therefore, when we look at how it's changing the context of many countries, including development, we really need to consider digital uh, from the point of view of the environment, climate, rights, inclusion, social protection, and so on. So, um, uh, you know, when Andreas, you spoke about, you know, everyone can drive different cars, different vehicles, it's the common rails that they will drive on, which is where we really need collective action. Um, and as the United Nations Development Program, we, have, uh, we are part of this extraordinary uh, moment to work with India and so many of our uh, partners in India as well as globally. And we really see uh, India very committed to an inclusive rights-based approach to digital public infrastructure. And we think th that those are almost centerpieces along with the technology that uh, Mr. Kant had also explained, that these are centerpieces to how we um, design, implement, and uh, ensure sovereignty, not just of countries, but of people, of users. Um, therefore, um, you know, we think that the opportunity for DPI is now, because across development, we have uh, endless stories, Arvind, of exclusion, of being left behind. And we're re very, very far away, actually, from achieving our global goals, the SDGs that was launched in 2015 as sort of an interdependence uh, uh, cooperation framework. But I think we are also recognizing at the UN that our collective problem-solving mechanism is not matching the pace and scale of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, and India's leadership and with it the potential of the digital public infrastructure has arrived with a great promise, uh, whether it's the G20 and a number of other bilateral and multilateral conversations happening. We think that uh, it's, you know, we need to focus on not our differences, but on the collective actions that we can take. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned, DPIs are the deep plumbing 
deep plumbing that would allow countries to, um, uh, and countries, communities, and people to uh, really sort of uh, make high-speed connection with a greener, a more sustainable, and a more inclusive future for all Arvind. But in that complexity, I think we need um, a cooperation framework that will enable countries to share reusable technologies as digital public goods. We need new administrative guides uh, that rises about geopolitics to shape outcomes that benefit development outcomes and that has the ability, the electrifying ability to um, ensure that government, the private sector, communities, and people can really deepen cooperation and benefit from digital public infrastructure. So I think on the role of the UN, the task at hand is extraordinary. Um, I think our Secretary General uh, had spoken about uh, how um, you know, we need a UN 2.0 uh, that you know, uh, can rise to the challenge, not just to have the right agenda, but also to have the mechanisms, the new strategies, the new programs that we need across 75 different countries that are at the moment building their digital public infrastructure. And, and so for us at UNDP, you know, as we have worked um, uh, in partnership to support the Ministry of Health in the implementation and the design of COVID around inclusion principles, we really look forward to ensuring that we can offer the UN and UNDP as a public pr platform to really amplify the development uh, outcomes that can be accelerated by 2030. Thank you, Kizom. And I have a second question for you, but that's uh, in the second round. Um, the, uh, one of the things that um, you know, uh, everybody, the audience in the room would be interested to know is uh, the, the whole genesis of um, the DPIs from India was in to bring about governance reforms. And um, uh, so the biggest user still actually lies the government. All our direct benefit transfer uses the jam trinity, which is the accounts, the, the bank accounts, the mobile connections, and the, and the identity uh, triangularized. Um, but then the, we started using it for startups, as Mr. Khan talked about. The telcos have used it. The biggest uh, telco rollout uh, in, uh, in 2016 uh, by, by, by a private sector company was built on the whole EKYC e that the, uh, the Indian DPIs, the India stack offered. And, and of course, the banks and fintechs use it. So apart from the government, it is uh, the society at large, fintechs, banks, telcos that use it. But government still remains the largest user of uh, DPIs, and it has saved the government. Today, uh, more than 330 federal schemes, the money that gets transferred, uh, to the beneficiaries actually flows through the, uh, the whole uh, the jam trinity that I explained. And, and why I explain that is because, um, Dr. Ussa, the question is to you. You represent the Rwanda Governance Board. And uh, we have used uh, uh, our top leadership uh, led by our Prime Minister has really transformed governance in India. The 100 rupees that was famously um, transferred from the government coffers, and the World Bank used to say only 15 reaches the intended beneficiaries, and 85 was lost in translation, uh, or with intermediaries, today is zero. That means 100 reaches the 100 people that, is the, that are targeted to, to receive that money. So we have zero lost in translation. Uh, that's the biggest governance reform. You, you know, the same money is able to feed to 6x more people, 7x more people. So, what is, how do you see India's experience in doing this governance transformation and Africa's ambitions converging? And I, I, you know, Africa is as diverse as India, even more. So please share some thoughts with us on that. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think coming from the question of diversity and governance and what the African continent can learn uh, through this, I think the continent comes with a historical disadvantage for most of the other the development aspects that have, uh, we have seen. And the opportunity of digitization gives us the opportunity to leapfrog. We do not have to go back to the fax system. We do not have to go back to the systems uh, that we are constructed many years before the continent had taken stock. So what the African continent needs to learn from India's experience is exactly what you said, being citizen-centric. I think digitization 
uh, puts the human face in service delivery uh, beyond the interaction of individuals, and I will address a few of the things that um, what we have seen digitization helping. Uh, first of all, as I said, it permits leapfrogging in a way that access to services do not need the traditional infrastructure. Um, when we went through the vaccination programs in Rwanda, we had the data and all information put up through a digital system and people only were able to go out for vaccinations, which allowed the security of the people, which allowed uh, the terms and conditions in which we are in to be comfortable. So that brings also the element that the continent struggles with, which is corruption. And I think in terms, with the exact example that you gave, in terms of how much dies in the process, financing in the process, the opportunity of digitizing permits transparency, it permits accountability, and that is the actual definition of governance. Governance that is citizen-centric, that allows accountability, that allows transparency, and for Rwanda we add that permits efficiency. So with the digital infrastructure and its accessibility, efficiency is a core element uh, in addressing some of the, of the governance challenges that the continent is facing today. If you look, uh, and we run uh, a citizen report card every year at the governance, at the Rwanda Governance Board, we've realized that most of the savings, the micro-saving schemes that exist, uh, are quite much more at the, uh, at the mobile banking level, at the mobile, uh, uh, mobile money systems level, than any traditional banks. So it means that we are able to introduce even uh, mobile saving in a way that is conducive and friendly if people had to go out to find the, infra the banking infrastructure as it exists. So the digital um, uh, system is probably the most uh, relevant in governance, in areas of e-governance, uh, more than 100 services uh, public services are now given digitally in Rwanda. Only five minutes you are able to get your child's birth certificate. And for public service delivery, you would know how much distance somebody has to make. And that is an economic transaction in itself, because if I don't have to make the distance, and I'm able to use the digital infrastructure to be able to access the services, then my production levels will be much more. So. Uh, the continent, and Rwanda in particular, have many things to learn from what India's experience has done uh, in allowing our social protection systems transfer money directly to the citizens. But also the e-commerce, the small e-commerce, the women that do coffee production are able to access markets globally with minimum middle persons. You know, while that is an employment structure for the middlemen, it's also a deprivation from those who are directly into the production. So the diversity itself is not a negative element. I think the contextualization is a core element. For everyone, the digital infrastructure is a relevant infrastructure. But how do we contextualize them? What is the legal framework that permits all of us to enjoy that without discrimination? And how enabling that structure itself is, is probably the most important element. So to end, I think um, India's experience permits the continent, uh, the opportunity, but there is going to be one condition, the cost, the digital cost. You know, the digital cost is still very high on the continent. And while the benefits are great, I think what, uh, what India is driving today in inclusiveness and accessibility and human-centric is really to make this digital public infrastructure less costly for the continent. Otherwise, uh, it will, will become the same history of infrastructure, and the African continent will remain under infrastructure in these structures. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And um, you've just, uh, you know, um, uh, expanded on at least the two hashtags that Andreas gave us, human-centric and inclusion. So, um, 
I'm, I'm going to ask uh, this to Mr. Amitabh Kant. Sir, you, um, you've been uh, the G20 Sherpa, you've already four or five months into the interactions, and one of your biggest uh, uh, tracks and discussion issue uh, topics is the digital public goods, the data for development. How it is, uh, and what we have been hearing over the last, not only just uh, over this conference, but over any multilateral uh, uh, you know, exchanges that we've been having, that everybody is amazed at what the scale and the diversity and the inclusiveness that India has brought up about with this uh, digital infrastructure. H how is this being received by the other G20 plus nations? And, um, and you know, uh, how do we extend this technology as Dr. Usa also said, in a trust-based manner to other countries. It's important to understand the challenge before the world. And the challenge is that uh, in the world today, there are four billion people without a digital identity. There are two and a half billion people who do not even have a bank account. There are 133 countries in the world which do not have a fast payment mechanism. And therefore, when India finds the solution for the 1.3 billion people of India, it is not finding a solution for India, it is finding a solution for the next 4.5 billion people who are going to move from poverty to middle class in the world. So this is a techno-legal solution of real-time, real-time lifting people above the poverty line across the world. And that is the big achievement of India. And it's important because I'm making this point because today you can't lift people above the poverty line and you can't do transformation without digital transformation. And digital transformation means that you sh the ability to flow credit to people. We were able to do, during the COVID period, we were able to provide direct money into the bank account to 500 million people, 500 million people during the COVID period. When we started opening Pradhan Mantri Jandan Bank Yojana, bank accounts, only 17% of the women in India had bank accounts. Today, 82% of the women in India have a bank account, and all of them say 82%. So what have you done? You've taken care of the people, the poorest of the poor during the COVID. You've done women-led development. You've ensured financial inclusion, and you've given huge amount of authority and power to the women because the bank accounts are opened in their name. And that is what you need to take across the world. So what, when you tell this story to the G20, and because you are also ensuring that the data remains with the citizens through the Data Empowerment Protection Act architecture, many countries say just replicate this model in their country. Say, just take this model and replicate in this country. Now, the challenge is twofold. One is when we did the bank accounts 2015 to 2017, 500 million bank accounts opened. There was huge political and administrative will coming from the Prime Minister of India. So, whatever you do in any country, it requires a huge political and administrative will of that country. Number one, that's important. It can't be done. You can't create a great digital model and say, I'll translate it and put it in another country. You can, that I'll put it in a cloud, in a box, and put it there as, but you need huge governance will in that particular, that's what I feel from the experience of India. India has been able to achieve this because of massive political will. And that is what is required in many other countries. And the second is our ability to put this as a great business model for Indian enterprises to take it across the world to population scale at low cost. Population scale at the lowest cost possible because government officers like all of us will keep getting transferred but the business enterprises must be able to do it on large scale across the world and they'll be best equipped to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Andreas, I'm going to come to you because uh, what Mr. Kant just mentioned. Um, we've seen um, financial systems being weaponized, technology being weaponized in the last one and a half, one year, one and a half years, and um, you know the context that I'm saying. How to take the discussion further? While India is offering this to the world, 
meant countries are asking for it. How can we build trust into it and how can countries think that this is co-creation rather than something that can be weaponized in the future? Yes, that's a very, very good uh, point. I think I need to go back to my hashtags in order to kind of uh, <laughs> make sure that we... we Two of them have already been addressed by Dr. Uthra. I have, I'm just I have three new ones, okay? <laughs> uh, in order to make Amitabh's vision a reality. Uh, hashtag number one would be... Uh, we are not yet there in terms of infrastructure. So we need to build uh, the network so that everybody can take part in this process. Because, uh, I mean, you took a courageous decision with the digital identity, but you also invested in the networks and you had to make sure that everybody can take part. And your vaccination campaign is actually a fantastic example of what you can do with digital technologies. Uh, and this uh, is a worldwide example. So I think the hashtag infrastructure uh, inclusiveness is one of the most important that the people believe in, in the vision that everybody can take part and that we do not create a digital divide. Uh, second, uh, and even if the word interoperability is difficult, and I, I really struggle to pronounce it every time, it's very, very important. I, this question about uh, digital identity and how to make it interoperable with, uh, with other systems across the borders, and that's why we are talking in the G20 and in other fora. I give you an example. When COVID uh, struck us, uh, I'm, I'm commuting between uh, Berlin, Potsdam, Germany, and Paris, France. Uh, so I take a plane every Monday, come back every Friday. Uh, suddenly, we got this COVID ups. So I had a German COVID up for Germany. I had a French COVID up for France. Uh, and at one moment in time, there was a European up, which was already a, 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 a progress. And then I went to the G20 meetings uh, to Indonesia, so I had to download uh, the Pendulungi uh, Limpani up, uh, which is the Indonesian up. And then I went to Switzerland, and we had the Swiss up. So the question is how we make this system, and this is possible. And I, I agree with Amitabh. We need to extend uh, some of the good systems and have international agreement, have the framework for that. And last hashtag is the people and the systems. We need to take the people with us. i give you another example. This is uh, my boarding pass from last week when I traveled from Bengaluru via Mumbai via Munich to Berlin, back home from the finance minister. I almost lost my flight in Mumbai because of this stamp. Because normally I travel like Amitabh with an electronic boarding pass and I go just from one gate to the other. Not so in Mumbai. In Mumbai, they told me after I was standing in the fast track of, uh, in a fast lane, 30 minutes, which is normal out in European airports, that you stand in fast lanes, uh, 30 minutes. But uh, it's, uh, they told me, no, you cannot go through. Even if they had the system for the electronic boarding pass, they told me, you need a printed boarding pass. So I had to go to the Lufthansa counter, which was on the other end of the airport, 20 minutes. They gave me the boarding pass. I came back and they said, oh, now, you can, now we can stamp the boarding pass so uh, you can go through. It is, the whole thing cost me 45 minutes and I had a layover of uh, one hour 15 or so. So this is just an example. We need to make sure that we really use the thing and that we do not run two parallel systems. We do not run, on the one hand, the digital system and the, the bureaucratic system. So this is, uh, this is my audit because why on earth you do, do you need to put a stamp on a boarding pass so if, you have, if you can do it electronically? So that's a, the point uh, that where I think uh, we still have some, some work to, to go uh, in order to really ensure that everybody trusts in the system and everybody takes part in the system. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, that is work in progress. I'm, let me assure you that we have Digi Yatra coming up for international travel and that will be solved by the next time you make that trip. Uh, it will be without any paper uh, stamping. In fact, no need for a boarding pass also. You can just scan your face and go through the airport. You can try that at domestic in Delhi airport right, already. But I, I really come to that question to you, Kazem. She, you know, Andres talked about standards and interoperability, and I, I think this is a very, um, a very big point. We have still not been able to agree on how to charge our phones uh, uniformly across the world. Um, uh, do you think we can achieve standards in terms of payments 133 countries don't have a real-time payment system. Here there is a solution which does 8 billion transactions a month, almost 100 billion a year. 40% of the real-time payment systems happen in India. How, how do we, I mean, this is a standard available for us. How can we work uh, as, with the United Nations to make this a global standard? 
Arvind, great question. Um, and as much as we have heard, uh, you know, from our from my co-panelists about um, the significant uh, impact of uh, the Indian digital public infrastructure approach, um, we have also seen when that similar approach has been uh, has been applied in the state of Palestine, for example, or in the West Africa nation of Sierra Leone. Um, you know, the ability to pay. 37,000 frontline health workers during the West Africa Ebola crisis who were going on strike, you know, because they had not been uh, receiving their promised danger pay. Um, a common registry that was shared across government departments and development partners was really able to identify who to pay the right amount um, and uh, uh, at, you know, sort of um, uh, through which uh, sort of outlet. And then sort of the two, the only two mobile companies at that point in the country um, plugging into a common infrastructure of distribution such as agents. Now, obviously, that's very rudimentary compared to the sort of um, significant uh, um, kind of advances that the India digital public infrastructure has made. But the point that I'm trying to make is that for the United Nations, digital public infrastructure is not about a particular technology. It's about the interoperability of the technology. It's about its reusability that can really create climate data exchanges, you know, sort of cross-border uh, payment mechanisms. And therefore, Arvin, to your point, I think it remains an unanswered question, but a really important one that we should be answering uh, uh, very soon. And, you know, the UN is, is, is basically a collection of member states, our member states that represent um, almost all the world. And, you know, I think um, it's really important to recognize that so much of the development assistance to in countries is really around sectors. There's, there's almost no uh, investments on the c common goods layer that's really important. And, and this is where UNDP has been advocating for this agenda in the Global Digital Summit uh, that's coming up or the Global Digital Compact, as well as really seeing the need for that because as um, um, you know, uh, Amitabhji also recognized, uh, digital public infrastructure is a whole of government approach, right? An ID ministry coming and learning here is not going to help you solve the political capital, the investments, and the planning that's required. And, and therefore, you know, my sort of uh, uh, ask to the G20 countries, to the world as the United Nations is to, you know, increase the investments in digital public infrastructure at the country level, you know, to start off with two to three member teams that can really uh, bring and work with that whole of government approach, the whole of society approach, and interact with the technologies, the resources, the learnings that are available around the world, especially in India. Thank you very much, Kesum. Um, and, and um, you know, uh, last question to you, Dr. Usa, and uh, then we'll see if we have time for question answers from the audience. But, um, you know, uh, one of the big things, and not necessarily in the context of digital public infrastructure, is that cut and paste technology doesn't work. And, um, uh, and I have lived far enough in Silicon Valley to say that, you know, they think from the top down. Africa is a vast continent. How can we bring in African diversity to ensure cut, not cut and paste technology, but more inclusive technology that has been talked so much about uh, by Andreas, by Kizum, by Dr. Uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, and everybody else. So, you know, how can um, uh, how can that be utilized now to really make technology really inclusive and bottom up? Well, thank you very much again, uh, and I think the continent has itself um, shaped what it wants to look like. So. We have the Agenda 2063 that reflects what the African continent and what, the, what kind of African we want to produce by 2063. And of course, we are part of the SDGs. And uh, I think we all understand that SDGs is, a, is about partnership. And I think um, how we bring the diversity is that partnership actually happens in diversity. And therefore, we are able to understand and appreciate the differences, you know. In Rwanda, precision agriculture is key, given the landscape and character of that. And I think the truth is really about the population as well, in, in terms of looking at Africa in a great sense. But I want to highlight two key elements of how we bring the continent on board. First, digital literacy is still very low. And digital literacy is 
going to be informed by accessibility. So two challenges that can become an opportunity is the problem of digital literacy coupled with the absence of um, accessibility. In Rwanda, we are, running a, uh, we, are running a, we are running a campaign called Connect Rwanda, and the intention is to give access to uh, smartphones to as many people as you can. And I think we all know these, these smartphones, we learn on how to use them by owning them. So one of the things of crossing uh, the diversity that exists on the continent is permitting access, giving us, um, <coughs> allowing the continent to have the resources, the required resources in sharing these public goods, uh, digital public goods, but also creating the knowledge having the right knowledge, the right skills, and that will not be a top-down. That is what makes it citizen-centric. It will be responding to the actual challenges that the citizens have, and we build the right knowledge that people need to do uh, the digital, to become part of the digital economy. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm seeing Shub telling us that there is, we are just out of time. Um, I had to, uh, I, believe me, it's a tough job to take the stellar panel and contain uh, within the 40 minutes I was allocated. So thank you very much for, uh, to my co-panelists for making sure that we, we stick to our, stuck to our time. And with that, a round of applause for the panel and thank you very much. <laughs>